You're listening to Geo Up Over and Down Under. I'm Kat. And I'm Rose. Today, we will be speaking with Rosalind Peterson, who is the California president and co-founder of the Agricultural Defense Coalition, ADC. Formed in 2006 to protect agricultural crop production from uncontrolled experimental weather modification programs atmospheric heating and testing programs, and ocean and atmospheric experimental geoengineering programs. In 1995, Rosalind became a certified USDA Farm Service Agency crop loss adjuster, working in more than 10 counties throughout California. Many crop losses through the state can be attributed to weather-related causes. Rosalind earned a BA degree from Sonoma State University in Environmental Studies and Planning, ENSP, with emphasis on agricultural and crop production. Between 1989 and 1993, Rosalind worked as an agricultural technologist for Mendocino County Department of Agriculture. After leaving Mendocino County, she took position with the USDA Farm Service Agency as a program assistant in Mendocino, Sonoma, and Salinas County's offices. Ms. Peterson has won several awards in recognition for her extensive efforts to protect drinking water supplies from toxic chemical contamination in Martinez, California. We are very pleased to welcome Rosalind Peterson. Welcome aboard, Rosalind. Thank you, and it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you very much. Um, I'll start off with the first question, Rosalind. Um, Rosalind, please start by telling us a little bit about yourself and the development, the California Skywatch, and the Agricultural Defense Coalition, if you could, please. Yes. I was born and raised on a working farm in Mendocino County in Northern California. My agricultural background goes back to my earliest years when um, I helped out uh, all through um, uh, from almost birth all the way up through my 18th birthday with agriculture issues on our farm. When I graduated from high school, one of the things that I did was to keep my interest in agriculture. And when I returned to college, I also returned to working for the Mendocino County Agricultural Commissioner's Office as an agricultural technologist and later went to work for the United States Department of Agriculture in California. My job there was assessing crop damage or crop losses for people that suffered uh, from having uh, certain types of weather related or other types of losses and we assessed the damages and determined the cause of those losses. In 2002, I became interested in the subject matter of persistent jet contrails and what was happening to our skies, the man-made clouds that these jets produced, the white haze. And I found that we were having a lack of direct sunlight reaching the earth due to this increase in cloudiness produced by the jets. So I initiated a series of studies, which culminated um, in two websites. Uh, one is CaliforniaSkyWatch.com, and the other website is AgricultureDefenseCoalition.org. And these two sites contain about 30,000 PDF files, photographs, and uh, government documents, uh, university studies, and a whole host of other information. They are linked together through the categories section. So anyone going to either one of the websites can click on categories and get an alphabetical listing of many of the issues that we will discuss here today. The reason for the creation of both of the websites is as informational for people to know uh, what my research was about and to understand clearly the negative impacts of not only persistent jet contrails but other, uh, other programs of upper atmospheric testing that are being conducted as we speak, which also include weather modification programs. Okay. Uh, yes, Rosalind, you, on your website you, you have literally hundreds, thousands of government documents and PDFs that are quite simply proof of the historical and current weather modification programs. 
Um, these programs have been going on for decades. One of the documents I recall went back to 1961. Now, um, from your position, where did the, the programs, when did the programs begin? Uh, have you noticed an escalation? And if so, when? The earliest programs uh, for weather modification in the United States date back to the 1940s. There was some early ex um, experiments that were conducted. And then a couple of experiments with hurricane modification went awry. And so the interest in weather modification declined for several years. But in the last 20 years, there's been an escalation in the number of companies that perform weather modification and not only here in the United States, but around the world. There's approximately 76 countries now engaged in weather modification programs around the world. And in the United States alone, there's about 66 such programs. They are escalating in scope and number, and the techniques are changing and becoming more and more perfected with time. And the implication for agricultural crop production um, and the ability to have normal climates for that type of crop production is becoming unlimited due to the extreme number and scope of, of these experimental weather modification programs. All right. Um. Rosalind, could you explain to our listeners about your experiences trying to raise awareness and gathering information about ongoing geoengineering programs and how the term chemtrail rather than persistent contrail influenced and ultimately hindered your efforts? Yes, I can do that. When I first started to look in 2002 at the phenomenon of jet trails persisting long enough to turn into a white haze or man-made clouds. The, what I found on the internet was that the word chemtrails had been introduced into the lexicon. And the first thing I did was head off to the United States Air Force website. When I typed in the word chemtrail, I discovered immediately that they had listed it as a hoax. NASA, uh, the EPA, a lot of universities also, whenever you Googled in the term chemtrail, I came up with hoax or Internet conspiracy. Um, and the idea that uh, people were using a term that had been declared by the United States government and many of its agencies a hoax meant that I decided not to use the terminology back in 2002 when I first started investigating. However, so many people use this undefined term that I was discovering more and more that they were becoming marginalized by their elected officials and the media because whenever they used the term, then the media would come back and say, well, the Air Force or the EPA or NASA all have said that this is, that the term is an Internet hoax and therefore um, they would marginalize the people and make fun of the people that use the terminology. Um, there's even one document on a NASA website which declares that people that use the term are net cases. So I stopped immediately using the terminology and kept my credibility and also made it harder for, for the press and for elected officials to marginalize what I was having to say about the subject. Thank you, uh, Rosalind, for, for clarifying that because this is, this is something that we are all coming up against. Initially, uh, chemtrails was the term that uh, we were using and when we took this to our own government officials, of course, we, we soon learnt that it was the big red flag uh, and we were dumped in a heap with conspiracy theor theorists. So uh, we've, we, we've learnt that one the hard way too. Now, I understand that because of your change of, of language, um, you've, you've had opportunities uh, to speak at the United Nations concerning yes, the topic the, of geoengineering. 
Uh, yes, I, I actually spoke. I didn't speak about actually the topic of geoengineering at the time at the United Nations. I was a keynote speaker on climate change and agriculture. And one of the things that I was able to bring forward without using the word chemtrail, one of the issues I did speak about was the persistent jet contrails and their impact on climate, their impact on how they change the weather, their impact on, um, in other words, um, agriculture crop production in the sense that when you reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the earth, which is what they do when they form these man-made clouds, that you would have a lack of uh, photosynthesis. And this would mean that it would reduce, the, reduce your crop production from having this lack of photosynthesis. So I was able to talk about these plumes and the jets and what, how much the impact that aviation was having not only on agriculture but on human health and some other issues in the two presentations I gave before the United Nations back in 2007. How was it received, Rosalind? It was received exceptionally well. Um, both of the times that I spoke, there was standing room only in the audience, and it was received well, but people who saw it for the first time were shocked because they had seen the plumes but never the big photographs of the plumes up on a big screen, and no one had ever introduced them really to the subject on how they could have a negative effect on the environment. Okay, excellent, excellent. It's good to know that uh, there's a, a serious voice out there uh, for this issue. Now, uh, Rosalind, I listened to, to an interview uh, with yourself and Michael Edward a couple of months ago on the weather hedge funds. This one was particularly disturbing. Can we uh, discuss the betting on the weather with the Mercantile Stock Exchange? Yes. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange a couple of years ago decided to open up betting on the weather in the futures market. Um, so what happens is that you can bet on, at this particular juncture in time, you can bet on whether there's going to be more snow or less snow or more rain or less rain in certain areas. You can do all kinds of weather betting on what kind of uh, weather a certain state or a certain county can have. It's pretty expensive on what you can bet upon. However, in the United States and in other countries, it is well known that uh, we have weather modification companies. It's well known that, for example, Pacific Gas and Electric Company modifies the weather in Plumas County. 